my name's Tom Nelson, and we're here in a uh, abandoned shop here, uh, just because it's quiet. I've been building motors pretty much since I was 11, uh, but uh, professionally I started the, my company in 1995. Our main specialty these days is, is turbocharged engines, but we do everything supercharged, naturally aspirated, injected, um, but mainly V8 style engines. Yeah, there's a lot of things about the LS that make it special. Well, they make a lot of power, um, they're light, and they're cheap. So, I mean, you know, a, a lot of the guys that are doing the swaps, they'll go and get some, a used LS out of the junkyard or, um, or even do a new one and you can pick those up for, let's say, three or $4,000 or something and have 400 horsepower that you can put, in, put into something and then you can can it and head it, head it and, pretty easily be 550, 600 horsepower. So um, it just lends itself to being swapped, you know. But LS is like the hottest engine in the world right now. I mean, they pretty much are, are like swapping it into Jeeps and the Miatas and the, you name it. But uh, the architecture is really hot. I mean, everybody has an LS. Well, the biggest thing is, is the uh, cylinder heads. Uh, it's just the, the head flows so much. I mean, you can get a, like an LS7 head, it comes CNC ported from the factory, and it flows on my flow bench like 360 CFM on the intake port. And to put that into layman's turn, five years ago, there was NASCAR heads only flowing that, that well. All an engine is, is, is an air pump. So the more air you can get in, the more air you can get out, uh, and then you can burn more fuel to that air, so you're gonna make more horsepower. In general, it's really all about the air that's going in and, and going out. I mean, there's a zillion things about that motor that are, that are, are cool, but in, in the big picture, it's the air, you know. They've got the cam core, they made the cam core, which is normally, you know, about this big. They bumped it up to 55 millimeters, and when you get a big 55 millimeter cam core, you can add more camshaft acceleration and the lobe is more gentle. Uh, so you can actually have a cam that's more aggressive, but actually more gentle than a smaller one. That big 55 millimeter cam core is nice, and then the mains are six bolt mains, so you have four bolts holding the, the cap, and then you got two going in the cross there, so it gives it some good, uh, and, and the block is a, uh, is a Y block, so the, the block itself comes down so it's not open like a small block or a big block Chevy. So you got a lot of rigidity in the main cap there. Another thing that's really nice about the LS motor that that's just leaps and bounds better than the old motor is that the way it's gasketed, it's got a one piece rear main. The pan gasket is, it's, it's one piece. It's all these really nice O-ring style gaskets. So like small block and big block Chevys, you know, they always seep oil. Uh, the LS's, they're really tight just because of the, the architecture and the way they design the gaskets. It's cheap, it's easy, it's light. It's, it's, that's why it's the best right now. It's, it's just, it's attainable by everybody. Yeah, iron and aluminum is all they've made, out, made them out of. The pros and cons of aluminum, I think what I've always found is that um, anytime I do an aluminum engine block, obviously you get a weight savings. I think it's almost 100 pounds on an LS. The, the iron LSs are just monsters, you know. The big advantage of an aluminum motor to me is that they always tend to cool better. Um, they, you know, take that heat and they, they get the heat out of the coolant. So, so for whatever reason, you know, when you get into real high performance cars, you're almost always taxing the coolant. So you need a big radiator, but you usually borderline on, on whether you can cool that car or not. When you go to an aluminum block, um, I'll usually see 15 to 20 degrees that it eases up on the cooling system. You know, the big pro with iron is it's just burly. You know, it's, it's strong. So um, 
you know, if I'm going to do like a heavy hitter street engine or something, I usually like to have iron in there because it, you can just, you know, it doesn't move as much as iron, aluminum. I mean, they're both cast. You can break aluminum cast and break cast iron. You, can, you know, you can tell how much stronger iron normally is. So, you know, your big uh, pro with iron is, is that it's strong. Um, another pro is that it's cheap, you know. Um, you can always pick up an iron block a lot cheaper than you can pick up an aluminum block. So somebody who's building it, you know, like I, I can go get a RHS uh, aftermarket 6-bolt LS block for 4500 or I can get a GM LSX block, um, you know, same architecture for around, you know, $2,500. So you're going to save $2,000. You'll take a weight penalty, but you'll get some strength out of it and both will perform great. The aluminum block will probably cool a little better. There's a couple ways you can go about building the motor. I mean, you can go ahead and, you know, have the same combination and do the same thing over and over again, and you don't really need to check a lot of things. But in our shop, we're always doing something different, and there's just a specific procedure we follow. It, it takes, like, uh, close to 300 hours to do a motor, you know. For sure, we start with the right block. Um, you know, back in the day when there weren't blocks available, um, you know, we would do all sorts of things like half fill it with cement and all the machine work and putting main girdles on there. But now they have blocks available that you can buy that are made to handle the horsepower. So the first thing to do is just you always you spend the money on the foundation and you buy the right block. Uh, after that, you just have to do, you know, the correct machine work, obviously. So we go to great lengths of, you know, how we bore it and how the bores are straight. And then when we hone it, we put a deck plate on it and simulate the cylinder head bolts being distorted and we run the exact gasket that's going to be on the motor when we hone it and um, you just get everything blueprinted to what we know works. So obviously, I mean, it's a given that you, you do the machine work correctly, but you got to buy the right piece to begin with. The, the way we go about building a motor in the shop is it's usually built a, a few times before it's actually final assembled. So like if we are gonna hone it, we hone it with the, the right gasket. If we're gonna line hone it, you know, not for an LS, but for like a small block Chevy, we'll put the oil pump on it. That way that the torque that you put on that oil pump distorts the main cap and then we hone it that way. Um, if you're going to, you know, put a big crank in it, you wanna make sure that the rods clear the cylinder as it clears the camshaft. So you, you do all of this stuff, like give you an idea, you put the rods and crank in it and if it needs to be clearanced, you clearance the block. Um, you check your, you know, make sure that the piston is sitting, uh, you know, up at the top of the deck because I like we like to put our pistons a certain, you know, dimension away from the deck. And you mock all these things up and you figure where you're out and then you go ahead and deck what you want off of it. You put the right amount of uh, main housing clearance in it. You put the right amount of cylinder bore clearance in it. Um, so you, you go ahead and pre-measure all these things and then you machine it and then you do another mock-up just to make sure that everything clears and that everything looks copacetic and then usually then you go out and clean everything, you know, doctor style and then you put it together final. So, I mean, one of the big things that I see all over the internet and all over the, you know, even some of the top builders is that, you know, they take a normal LS block, which let's say it's a six liter truck block or a six two um, aluminum block, and then they go and put like a four inch crank or a four and a quarter crank in it, and it'll make it, you know, uh, 427 inches or 408 inches or whatever it ultimately comes out with the, the crank that they put in. But um, you get, you run into something where not a lot of people understand is that that crank stroke, that bore, the sleeve length on that bore is, you know, roughly from the stock ones, like 5.5 inches long. So the piston, when it comes down on with that extra crank stroke, it pulls the piston way out of the bottom of the bore. So the skirt comes out a ton, almost down to the oil ring and then rocks and then the crank comes back and says, you're coming right back up. So LSs are notorious for oiling because they wear the skirts out on the things because all these guys are putting stroker kits in the thing, but they have no support for the piston. 
on the bottom of the piston you have you have your skirt and right. then on the skirt you know the pin goes through and usually you measure the skirt it's usually about 500 thousandths from the bottom of the skirt and that's your gauge point and where you you take your micrometer and you measure that and you set up your piston in a wall based off of where that gauge point is well it's pulling that piston past the gauge point so that skirt that's designed to have that specific amount of clearance it's actually getting pulled past that so the skirt isn't necessarily straight the skirt you know measures different in all different spots of the skirt so once it gets past that point you lose you know it might open up three or four thousandths so then not only does it not have the stability of being in the cylinder and holding itself but now it's out of the cylinder and it's past its gauge point so you have like double clearance problems and then obviously the crank is at it you know it's coming around and just says you know you're going up so the piston just and it goes up but it starts wearing the skirts out so then you you end up you know with a whole mess of things not just not just that you know so you know aftermarket manufacturers wanting to make a dollar they go and offset the pins and then they do you know you know special barrels on the skirts to try to alleviate that but they're all band-aids you know if you want to put a big crank in an ls you go to a tall deck block and that keeps the piston in the bottom of, you know, from coming out of the bottom of the hole and and just it just lives a lot longer ls7 the 505 horse motor chevy actually figured that out and if you look at the ls7 motor they actually extend the sleeves past the bottom of the block because it has a four inch stroke in it. And then another company that actually picked up on that is uh, Comp, who is this RHS, and they have some of the longest sleeves in the industry. So their short deck is like 5870, and I think their tall deck is like 6300 or something like that. And that makes such a big difference for the, for the wear on the pistons, you know. Everybody thinks that, oh, just because there's an aftermarket intake that um, it must be better. But um, I've done countless hours of testing with, with factory intakes and aftermarket intakes. And in street cars where your operating range is from like zero to 6,000, um, Chevy knew what they were doing. They made a really nice long runner, you know? And that long runner, it's so good for building mid-range power. Um, you wouldn't believe what changing the intake track length actually does to the power curve. Like we actually, uh, we have a new intake that we're uh, coming out with called the X-Ram. And it's basically a laid over tunnel ram. And the reason why we did that is to try to get a really good size port that has the right taper angle and everything but still get that long runner so you can have that bitch in bottom end and bitch in mid range. What normally happens is you put a big cam in it and you want it to run upstairs. Uh, so then you shorten up the intake runner so it runs upstairs, but then you end up with this car that doesn't run downstairs. But with, uh, you know, there's a fine line between a long runner and a short runner. To give you an example, I've done testing with tunnel rams versus stock intakes and versus the fast intake and you know and the stock intake and the fast intake almost always kick ass on just about everything up until about 5500 and then from 5500 up you know then the other shorter runner intakes you know start turning on but in a street car that's like a big loss you know everybody's putting these sheet metal manifolds on that look really cool they've got you know some short runners and a and a small plenum volume, uh, and those are total turkeys, you know. I mean, people spend thousands of dollars to lose lots of horsepower to do that. So um, you might be surprised at how well the stock intake actually does work, you know. It, it would surprise you to see um, the dyno tests that I've done. I've seen like um, from a very well-known claimed high horsepower intake, I've seen a 150 foot-pound loss on what everybody claims is good. Tuning is, is a huge part of 
whether or not the engine runs right or not. I mean, there are so many parameters of tuning, you know, I mean, just even down to idle quality. If you're gonna do uh, any kind of mods, you definitely want to make sure that it's tuned properly afterwards or you're really missing the boat, you know. Um, you can take a motor, and especially on the, on the LS stuff where it has like a lot of, uh, you know, learn and, and, and knock retard and stuff like that. Um, you know, it'll pull 13 degrees out of the motor if it sees a little knock, you know, and 13 degrees versus just not putting that timing in Beforehand, you're talking, you know, 50 foot pounds, 100 foot pounds, maybe. So uh, you definitely want to have the thing tuned correctly. Same thing with air fuel ratios. You know, I mean, now, you know, like on the new LS, they're using mass airflow sensors and, you know, they set up a specific desired air fuel ratio table. So maybe at cruise, they want 14.7 um, air fuel ratio and then maybe under load, uh, they'll 13 or 12.6 or I don't, I don't really know you know depending on the engine uh, but every engine seems to like its own number you know I mean there is no perfect air fuel ratio I could have one motor that loves 11 and I could have one motor that loves 12 so when you actually test it I usually what I what I'll do is I usually well first I go all the way rich until it starts coughing a little bit and then I lean it out the other way and then I know where my where where my two uh, edges are and then I find a safe medium in the me in the middle it's very difficult to tell you oh this head is the best because there is no head that's the best um, when you start building motors like now it's going on I don't even know, you know, 20 years professionally, um, you realize the more you know, the less you know. So the motor is really about a combination of parts. So, you know, what you pick out for a camshaft, what you have for an intake manifold, what you have for uh, exhaust pipe diameter, exhaust pipe length, um, collector diameter, all of those players combine into a combination and one head might work really good for one combination and one head might not work at all for another combination. It's a general rule of thumb. You know, I like to have a cylinder head that flows really well on a streetcar up to the valve lift that you're actually gonna run. So, you know, some hot streetcars, we run, you know, 650, 6, 660 valve lift. I like to make sure that the valve job and the port is designed to flow really good up to that point because if the head flows 450 CFM at eight or 900 valve lift, and you have a cam that only goes to 650 valve lift, then you're throwing away all that air on the table and most likely a head that flows good at 900 valve lift is gonna be sacrificing some air on the bottom. And when you think about it, the mid lift number is like the most important lift number because the valve is going by it twice. It goes by it opening, and it goes by it closed. So you want your low and mid lift numbers to be strong. I mean, obviously you want a good peak number, but you want your low and mid lift numbers to be strong because it's spending a lot of time there.